came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt This is Friends Online, with original music from Friends Worship, and a look at what the Bible says, what it means, and why it matters. With me, Jay Hewitt, and our senior pastor, Matthew Corp. We've got fresh episodes every week with exclusive content tailored specifically for our online audience. We're just a text message away, and the church has left the building. I'm glad you're with us. Let's get into this. Hey, friends. Good to be with you today. Several years ago, I was in a pool with my neighbors in my community complex. And I was playing with my kids, and my daughter was in a pink flamingo inner tube going around me in a circle, and we were having fun. And as I was playing with my kids, one of uh, my neighbors uh, waved me over to a group of guys that were hanging out in the middle of the pool. And I was like, oh, I'm being summoned, cool. So I go over to this group of cool guys, and one of them was just like the CrossFit guy, you know, super strong, and he was posted up, like, mm, you know, real serious, had his aviators on. And I walked up to him, and I'm like, hey, I'm Aaron, how you doing? And he's like, 
how long you lived here for? He just like cut to the chase. And I said, seven years. And he said, I've never met you before. Let's go party. And I immediately felt this tension in my faith because I've been a Christian since I was 20 years old. I'm 40 now. And, uh, and I haven't really partied much in the last 20 years. The most partying I do is go to my kid's birthday, have pizza, and jump on a trampoline. So I didn't really know what to say. I felt pretty awkward. And on the outside, I was doing this like, okay, cool, yeah. But on the inside, I was pretty awkward and kind of freaking out. Now, I felt uncomfortable in that moment as a Christian. Have you ever had a situation like that before where your faith causes tension in your life? And I know for me, I'm tempted to just kind of avoid those situations altogether. But the goal of being a follower of Jesus isn't to be comfortable all the time, is it? Have you ever been too comfortable in your faith? I've noticed that when I'm too comfortable, my faith, in my faith, a couple of things happen. One, I get complacent and stop taking risks, and I get callous to the awe and the wonder of who Jesus is in my worship, in my witness. Being comfortable as a Christian isn't the goal and can sometimes hinder our faith. Living a life that is a compelling witness to the resurrected Jesus is. But guess what? We're not alone in this. Jesus' closest friends struggled with being too comfortable in their faith as well. In our passage, the disciples had grown comfortable with Jesus, so comfortable that they had begun to misunderstand who Jesus was and they were in jeopardy of not being a compelling witness. Jesus forces them out of their comfort zone to expand their understanding of him. And so turn with me to Matthew 17, one through nine. And we're gonna find out, how do I have a compelling Christian witness in my life? I'm gonna break this talk into three sections. While we don't have a compelling witness, why we must have a compelling witness, and how we can have a compelling witness. So Matthew 17 falls into a larger context of Matthew 16. And in Matthew 16, 13 through 28, Jesus is spending time with his 12 disciples. And he looks to Peter and he says to them, Peter, who do you say I am? And to Jesus' astonishment, he says, you are the Christ, you're the anointed one, you're the son of God. Jesus is so enthusiastic about Peter's answer because Peter got it right. But just because Peter got the answer correct doesn't mean that Peter understands what's going on. So last year, I learned how to play the card game Pinochle. And if any of you have learned how to play it before, you know that there's a variety of combinations that let you win the game. But the greatest hand in the game is called a double run in Trump. And that means that one player gets two of an ace, a 10, a king, a queen, and a jack of the same suit. It's really hard to get that. One local player that I researched while I was uh, looking up uh, the study of this said that he was 93 years old and he'd been playing since he was a teenager and he had never seen a double run in Trump happen. So here I am last July playing for the very first time on vacation with my in-laws and guess what happened? I got a double run in Trump within the first hour of playing. The chances of me getting that hand are 0.000040%. Now the truth is, I had no clue what I had in my hand. I knew it was a good hand, but I didn't realize how good of a hand it was. When I put it down, my mother-in-law pulled out her cell phone and began to take pictures of my hand and started to text message relatives all across the nation telling them that I got a double run in Trump. To this day, people still congratulate me from getting that hand from that game. Now, I had a double run in Trump, but I didn't understand what it meant. Peter said the right thing about Jesus. Just like my in-laws were astonished about my hand, so was Jesus as well. But Peter didn't fully understand what he had just said. Do you know how I know? Because in Matthew 16, verse 21, Jesus begins to teach his disciples about his death and the suffering on the cross. And Peter famously takes Jesus aside and he says to Jesus in verse 22, God forbid it, Lord. This will never happen, is what he says. And in verse 23, Jesus responds by saying, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. Peter had said the right words. You are the Christ. But he didn't understand what he meant. He didn't want to accept that Jesus would have to suffer and die for our sins. Peter had a very different version of Jesus in his mind. 
Now, what was going on and why? Peter and the disciples were so close to Jesus that they had become comfortable and blinded to Jesus' true identity and mission by their own preconceived ideas of who Jesus was. The fact is, Peter uh, and his view of Jesus was just too small. A New Testament scholar, Michael Wilkins, who was also a professor of mine, said this, Peter and the other disciples were honored to be in physical proximity to Jesus, yet that very closeness impeded their ability to understand the magnitude of the person of Jesus and his mission in the world. About 12 years ago, uh, there was a popular t-shirt that many youth pastors wore, and it said, Jesus is my homie. And as wonderful and as cool as that was, sometimes our closeness with Jesus can hinder our understanding of him, can it? We can become so comfortable with Jesus that we make him smaller than he really deserves to be. You know, we have so much content out about Jesus in today's world. It's great. There are healthy churches in many cities, even multiple ones around us right now. There are conferences to attend and great Bible studies written by scholars. There are YouTube channels and podcasts to listen to. And we have 2,000 years of church history to learn from our mistakes as Christians. And there's a lot of good in that. But one of the downsides is just like Peter, we can become so comfortable with Jesus that we can lose sight of Jesus and his unique person and work in the world. In other words, we can become so casual about how we approach Jesus that there really isn't anything compelling about our witness. You know, I love what Mike Erie said in Suburban Jesus. He said this, I think we may have lost sight of Jesus among the trappings of the Christian religion. Among all the hype about the growing cultural power, the growing numbers of mega churches, the booming um, subculture of Christianity, I wonder if we have left Jesus behind. Haunting words. We have to ask ourselves hard questions to grow in our faith. Questions like, have we become so comfortable with Jesus that we've lost sight of his true identity and mission? Are we so casual about Jesus that our witness of him isn't compelling? And is Jesus and, 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 it, and who I worship as him and, and, and as I serve him too small for the world to want to believe in him? These problems exist in our day, they're real. And it existed in Jesus' day. And so Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to a mountain to show them why they must have a compelling witness. And we pick up the story in Matthew 17, one through nine. It says this, after six days, Jesus took him, Peter, James, and John, and he led them up on a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. God has always met people on mountains and revealed himself to them. And now Jesus does that very thing. In fact, the word transfiguration in this passage literally means metamorphosis in the Greek. Who Jesus is on the inside is now manifested to the disciples on the outside. Jesus manifests a physical transformation that is visible to the disciples. The description here in our passage is this, his face shows like the sun, his clothes become as white as light. It must have been like looking at a spotlight for the disciples. It was blinding and it communicated Jesus' purity and his holiness. This transformation is a reminder of Jesus' pre-incarnate divine glory and is a preview of his future exaltation. Now, that's a mouthful. I get it. It's like, what did I just say right there? Let me, let me break that down for us real quick. So the Bible teaches that Jesus' existence did not begin at his human birth. The Bible teaches that Jesus, before he was born of a woman, existed as God. John 1, 1 through 3 says this about Jesus, and it talks about him as the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Jesus. And because God wanted a relationship with us, and he loved the world, he sent his only son, Jesus, to suffer on the cross and save us. And Jesus left the comforts of heaven to be with us. In fact, Philippians 2, 7 says that he emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant. Literally, the Greek means that he veiled his glory through taking on our humanity. This is what we celebrate at Christmas. And then one day, we will see Jesus in his future glory, just as he reveals himself in this moment. 
In Revelation 1.16, it describes Jesus like this. His voice was like the sound of many waters and his face like the sun shining in its strength. But in this moment, in this passage, with his disciples, for a glimpse, Jesus reveals his glory. On earth, for a moment, Jesus shows us what is true in heaven. And the disciples, they don't know how to make sense of this. Now, I gotta be honest. I struggled all week long to put into words of what this moment must have been like for the disciples and for us as we read it. And the truth is, I'm completely inadequate to communicate this moment and what the disciples saw. And I think the disciples were overwhelmed as well. Look at what happens in verse three and four. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put three shelters up, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Moses and Elijah show up, and they're two of the greatest leaders in the Old Testament. Moses represents the law, and Elijah the prophets. And Jesus is the fulfillment of both of them. Jesus said this earlier in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 17, I do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Their appearance on the mountain with Jesus represents the greatness of Jesus who actually transcends both. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of scripture. Moses and Elijah being there is like Michael Jordan going to Kobe Bryant's Hall of Fame moment. Greatness recognizes greatness. But in this moment, what's different is that it's not two men who are divinely endowed acknowledging to another man who's divinely endowed. Both of these men acknowledge that Jesus alone is divine. He's God. He's the fulfillment of the scriptures. And Peter and the disciples don't know what to do. They don't know how to process this. And I love Peter. He can't keep his mouth shut. And so again, he blurts out in verse four about this, this tent. And some scholars don't even know what he means. He's kind of babbling, if you will. And uh, he doesn't know how to actually process it. He says, again, I'll build a tent for you and Moses and one for Elijah. And, and he's just overwhelmed by the moment. Just like I struggle to put into words this transcendent divine moment on the mountain, so Peter doesn't understand how to make sense of it as well. He can't help but say things that just m and mumble and not understand what's going on. Now, I hiked up Half Dome uh, 10 years ago with a group of college students. And uh, I have a picture here of that, uh, that moment when I arrived up at the top of uh, a crest to look at the cables that you have to climb up to get to the top of Half Dome. And when I saw how steep the cables were, when I noticed how high I had to go and how steep and scary it was, I looked at those cables, my hands began to sweat, and I asked myself, can I do this? I asked myself, should I do this? And as I looked at this mountain, one of the college students walked up next to me, and I looked at her, and she had tears going down her cheeks. And she whispered under her, under, uh, just murmured under her, uh, under her breath, I don't know if I can do this. This is a moment like that for Peter, James, and John. They don't know how to make sense of this, and so Peter babbles. But in verse 5, God begins to speak. It says this, While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. I love it. God interrupts Peter. As he was speaking, God interrupts Peter. And he interrupts us from making stupid choices and saying stupid things. But through the crowd, or the cloud, excuse me, God interrupts Peter. And he says this phrase, um, this is my son who I love in whom I'm well pleased. These are the same thing that God says about Jesus in Matthew 4 at his baptism. It's not just a sentimental moment. God the Father actually quotes two passages in the Old Testament, Psalm 2 and Psalm 42. And it declares in those passages that Jesus is God and he's also the suffering servant who will die on the cross for his people. And at hearing this and hearing the Father's voice, Peter, James, and John have nothing to say. It says in verse 6, While the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground and they were terrified. If the disciples were too casual with Jesus before, now they aren't. Now they are full of terror. 
The only time I've ever fallen face down on the ground for anything was when I was nine years old and I felt the aftershocks of the 1989 earthquakes from the Bay Area. Hearing God's voice and seeing Jesus' divine glory sends them into terror. You know, fear is the normal response of all of us when we see a holy creator. Falling down into, in fear is actually the normal response of the biblical characters we see in the Bible too. It's Isaiah who sees God's glory and he cries out, Woe is me! Moses could only see the back of God's glory. Otherwise, he would have died, it says. John, in Revelation, falls face on his ground when he sees the heavenly picture. And the angels all day long cry out, holy, holy, holy. But guess what? This might shock some of us. It's not God's heart for us to view him with utter terror. Holy respect and awe, yes. But terror, no. Look at what Jesus does. Verse 7. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up. Don't be afraid. Seeing God in his greatness brings terror but this is why we have Jesus. Jesus is the mediator between us and God the Father. There is no one like Jesus. This is why we must have a compelling witness for Jesus, because only Jesus is able to be the mediator between us and God. And because he brings peace between us and God, like he did for the disciples on the mountain, we can now have a compelling witness for him. Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so Jesus takes his, two, his three friends up on the mountain to show them who he is. He is the way to God. Jesus does not do this to make them fearful or terrified. He does it to enlarge their view of him so that they would be a compelling witness for him. He shows them his glory to remind them of how big he really is. Pastor A.W. Tozer said this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So how do we have a compelling Christian witness? A compelling Christian witness begins with rethinking how big Jesus really is. When we have a big view of Jesus, you and I will have a compelling witness for Jesus. In fact, Peter writes firsthand about this moment in 2 Peter 1.18. He says this about the transfiguration. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Jesus received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. Peter calls the transfiguration moment sacred, awe-inspiring. It, it, he saw majesty. It changed his view of Jesus. I saw on YouTube last week um, the Queen of England, uh, her carriage riding around Buckingham Palace. And uh, as it rode around, people, people stopped and they fixed their gaze on the carriage, hoping just to see the Queen for a moment. It was majesty riding by. Friends, how much better is Jesus and his majesty? Glory and honor and majesty belongs to God. He's the mediator between us and God. The transfiguration of Jesus gave Peter, James, and John a big and majestic view of Jesus and inspired them to be compelling witnesses for him. So let me ask you something. Is your view of Jesus big enough? Does it inspire awe? Does it not just captivate your emotions but also your will so that you be willing to be a witness for him? This truth is so important because our view of Jesus will determine how we handle the challenges and the trials of this life. And how we handle our trials and challenges is often one of the most compelling witnesses to Jesus. You know, many of you know about Jay's story of overcoming brain cancer. It's an amazing story. Why is his story so compelling? Is it because of how big cancer is? Perhaps. But I think it's also because Jay knows how big Jesus is. Many people are walking away from Christianity and the local church because they don't see anything compelling about our faith. Pastor Mark Batterson in his book, In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day, writes about being courageous enough to face our challenges, which he symbolically calls lions. He writes this, Our problem seems really big because our God seems really small. In fact, we reduce God to the size of our biggest problem. You know what the greatest tragedy in life is? 
when somebody whose God gets smaller and smaller with each passing day. The more we grow, the bigger God should get. And the bigger God gets, the smaller our problems and challenges should become. Jesus is far bigger than we realize, men and women. He, we must realize and resist the temptation. We can't tone down or soften Jesus and his teachings. Otherwise, we may miss Jesus altogether. A compelling witness begins with rethinking how big Jesus is. And this might be a perspective change for you, and that is okay. It was for Peter, James, and John. Secondly, we can have a compelling witness for Jesus by being a, listen, being a listener of Jesus. In the passage, the Father says, listen to Jesus during the transfiguration. If we don't listen and obey Jesus, why would the world around us think it's worth their time to want to know Jesus? Remember, more is caught than taught. People learn by what you do more than what we say. And so let me ask you something. Are you listening? Are you obeying Jesus? We can't have a compelling witness if we aren't listening and obeying. Now, some of you might have heard um, that I am in the process of planting a life-giving Friends Church in Eastvale, California. And the hope is to launch the church in early 2022. And I want to share with you how the Lord spoke to me about that. Several months ago, our lead pastor, Matthew Cork, said for me to go out and to prayer walk in the area and to see if God was, was moving out there. And I went out there and I met a guy for coffee. And he was a podcaster and a businessman. And after meeting up with him several times, I got a chance to tell him my Christian testimony. And he said to me, Aaron, for the last year, I've been praying to God for help, for him to help me figure him out. His literal prayer was this, God, would you help me figure you out? And then he said to me, I met you, and I think you're an answer to my prayer. And so right then and there, I had a chance to lead my friend to have a personal relationship with Jesus. I got a chance to share with him the gospel and what God had done for him. And right there we prayed and he accepted Christ into his life. And he began to cry and uh, it was an amazing moment. And after that happened, I got in my car and I was driving home and I was thinking about this experience. And I asked the Lord, Lord, what are you doing? And I sensed Jesus say to me, Aaron, there are thousands more people in this area praying the same prayer, just like my friend. Help me figure you out. At that moment, I knew that Jesus was speaking to me and inviting me into a greater story as a witness to Jesus. What is Jesus inviting you into? I believe that he might be inviting some of you to join me and our team in this new church story. And if you're interested, if you live in Corona or Chino or Eastville or Ontario Ranch, tell them to come join or, or get information. In fact, you can email me at aaro at friends.church and I would love to connect with you and send you some information about our new campus. But for you today, do what the Father says. Listen and obey what Jesus tells you. Finally, we must extend our witness by declaring the goodness of Jesus. For as good as many Christian resources are out there, do not let the Christian subculture define the world's view of Jesus. The best way for the world to understand Jesus is through the power of your testimony and the Bible. Jesus is my homie. I love that phrase. But if Jesus only stays my homie, and that's all the world knows, we will have a serious problem on our hands. He is so much more. He wants more for you. He wants more for the world. You know, I imagine Jesus when he's walking up that mountain on the Transfiguration. I, th I think he's smiling as his disciples walk behind him. And I think he's absolutely stoked for the more that the disciples are about to experience through the Transfiguration. And so when was the last time you shared the goodness of what Jesus has done for you? I saw Satan fall like lightning darkness run for cover still the miracle that i just can't get over my name is registered in heaven i believe in signs and wonders i have resurrection power still the miracle that i just can't get over my name Registered in heaven. Yes, my praise belongs to you forever. This is my.
testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Sons and daughters But with blood and washed in water Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father Our God will finish what He started Yes, our God will finish what He started You might not have an, a testimony about overcoming cancer like, like Jay, but you do have an amazing story. You do have something to share about God's goodness, and he's given that to you to share. And so here's what I want you to do. Three times this week, in your everyday conversations, when you're asked, how are you doing? Would you start the conversation by saying, I'm so thankful for what God is doing in my life right now. Now, obviously, be authentic, right? But let's orient our speech to making Jesus look really good in our lives. Let's extend our witness by declaring the goodness of Jesus. Friends, when I picture the church that I want to be part of, I picture a church that has a powerful witness to Jesus. People experiencing God's love and healing in marriages and breakthrough in addictions and people being set free. I picture injustices being overcome through forgiveness and widows and children and kids in foster homes being brought in to the community. I picture families being strengthened and singles having a place at the table with us. And all those things and more are what happens when the church walks confidently in Christ and is a powerful witness to him. 
And so friends, let's listen to Jesus. Amen. Got questions? Check out friends.church slash alpha, where you can start your journey towards faith by joining a discussion group. It's open, it's informal, it's full of people just like you asking questions that really matter in life. If you're looking for a church home, check out friends.church slash locations, where you can find the Friends Church closest to you. You've checked us out online, now let's meet in person. We'd love to have you. Until then, subscribe to our YouTube channel, turn on notifications, and if anything you saw today blessed you, pass on the blessing to some friends by sharing our content. Until next time, be blessed.